Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick, um, and I work at Trailer Bits. Um, today, I'm going to. Oh, hang on. That's not what I wanted. Uh, so, hopefully, that will stay still. Um, today, I'm going to talk about threshold key destruction attacks. Um, and these are a type of attacks that I haven't seen explored very much in academia, but it's a type of vulnerability that we found in a number of different implementations of threshold signature schemes, so we thought we'd raise it uh, because we think it's interesting. So typically as cryptographers, we care about confidentiality and integrity. Like we don't want anyone to obtain our private keys, we don't want anyone to decrypt messages or forge signatures, but in this talk, we're gonna look at an attack that actually makes the system more secure in the sense that no one can ever use the key again. Uh, or in some cases, uh, they may be used to hold the key ransom. Um, and yeah, I, I wanna say this concept really only makes sense in the honest majority setting because with a dishonest majority, the attacker can just delete their key shares or refuse to participate. Um, so the first example of, of this type of attack that I've seen published is uh, in a paper by Amazon and Shlomovitz that was presented at Black Hat USA in 2020. And this targets the uh, uh, key refresh protocol that's used by a lot of different threshold signing schemes. Uh, and if you haven't seen key refresh before, uh, it's essentially a protocol that allows everyone to re-randomize their key shares. So before the protocols run, maybe one, uh, one participant has been careless and, and their key share has been compromised. Uh, but by running this protocol, everyone re-randomizes their key shares and uh, the old compromised key share is no longer usable. Uh, they are also useful for, uh, uh, they, they actually allow you to, to reset the group size uh, or change the group size and change the threshold. So they're also useful for that reason. Um, so anyway, um, what Amazon and Shlomovitz noticed was that in the last round of, of this protocol, uh, everyone sort of validates their inputs and checks that they're correct and that they match the public key that they know they should match. And if uh, everything looks okay, they go on and delete uh, their old key share and move on to the new key share. But if, if there's an issue, they abort the protocol and obviously they, they keep their old key share. So it turns out that if the attacker in the last round, so the attacker is, is the red little guy down there, if he sends different messages to different participants, this will cause some participants to think that the protocol completed and some participants to think that the protocol failed. So some participants will delete their old key shares and some participants will uh, keep the, the, the old key share. So now we're in a situation where um, uh, the orange participant is still on the old key share, the blue participant is on the new key share, and the only one who can actually help them to sign if this is a two out of three system is the attacker. So the attacker can actually hold the, the group ransom, which isn't great. Uh, so this is a known attack and, and I mean, it's been around for, for a long time in, in MPC time. Uh, so, so how do we fix this? Well, the solution presented in the paper is to use a, an extra key confirmation round where everyone basically uh, broadcast a message saying, uh, I completed the protocol, we're fine to move on to the new key share. And if everyone agrees that this went okay, we, we delete the old key shares and move on to the new key share. So this should be, uh, this should be fine, right? Um, well, it turns out that the attacker can just complete the re key reshare protocol correctly and then move the attack to the key confirmation round. So he would say to some participant that the protocol completed correctly and to some participant that, hang on, this, this failed, I'm aborting, and now we're back in the, in the previous situation. So that's, that's not great. Um, so we see uh, a number of different ways that this is typically solved. Uh, the problem is that it's almost never solved um, correctly. Um, so another solution that we see is some form of reliable broadcast or echo broadcast. Uh, 
where we perhaps uh, echo the message of everyone else in an extra round uh, to make sure that everyone sent the same thing to everyone else. But again, the, target, uh, the attacker can just target the last round of the echo broadcast instead, and we're back in the same situation as before. Um, a different solution that we see is that people say, so hang on, we're, we're doing threshold signing here, so let's just check that everyone has the correct key by performing a threshold signing where everyone participates. And if, if the signature is correct, then surely uh, everything went, went well and we can move on to the new key. Uh, so I, I think you, you know this is going. Um, the attacker can just target the last round of signing instead send correct messages to some participant, incorrect messages to others, which means that for some participants, the signature uh, won't match the public key, and for some it will, and you're back in the same situation as before. Um, so this is really a consensus problem, and it's, it's hard to solve without a consensus primitive. Um, so so this, is, this is a place where, where the attacker can sort of either hold the key ransom or destroy the key. Uh, so the next example that I want to look at is another attack against uh, uh, key resharing protocols, and in particular a, a primitive that's often used in these protocol called Feldman Verifiable Secret Sharing. Uh, so this is a common building block in these resharing schemes, and if you haven't seen it before, it's it's kind of like Shamir secret sharing, but you uh, that the dealer includes commitment to the uh, polynomial that they're using which means that everyone can verify their shares against those commitments, which is very nice. You know that you got the right thing. Um, and this, this is used by essentially everyone in, in this protocol, everyone reshares their own key share using Feldma verifiable secret sharing, and then you just add up the results at the end, and you get a new sharing of the same key. Um, so what we noticed was that um, the, those sort of what you end up in the end uh, is, is a Shamir secret sharing of, of the same key that you had before. Um, and the polynomial that, that corresponds to this uh, Shamir secret sharing is the sum of all the polynomials used by all participants. So, so obviously that, that means that if an attacker chooses to use a different polynomial of greater degree, uh, that, that polynomial will have greater degree, the sum, uh, which also means that the threshold will suddenly be higher. Uh, so that means that the attacker can actually raise the threshold by using a polynomial of higher degree. So this means that the commitments to the coefficients that the attacker sends will be longer than anyone else's. But if no one checks this, uh, that won't be discovered, and that means the, the attacker can now raise the threshold of, of this key. So, so how is this even an attack? Well, to start with, the attacker can set the threshold to be greater than the group size, and now suddenly no one can use this key anymore. So that's not great. Um, so a different thing the attacker can do is set the threshold equal to the group size. Uh, and now any signing operation or, or key recovery that's done has to include the attacker. So the attacker can hold the system ransom again. So uh, we went actually went out to look for this type of vulnerability and we found a lot of, uh, a lot of open source implementations uh, that were vulnerable to this. Uh, but I think we found 10 open source implementations uh, and we found even more private implementations that were vulnerable to this attack. Um, and we have a blog post on this uh, on our blog if you're interested. Um, so obviously this is easily mitigated, right? You just check the length of this commitment. Uh, I do want to say that that this is not in any papers that use uh, key resharing uh, based on, on Feldman verifiable secret sharing. Uh, so it's something that you sort of have to figure out on your own uh, or ask us. Um, so the final example that I want to talk about is DKLS 23. And uh, so luckily, the previous speaker has explained everything about OTs and DKLS23. Um, so I don't have to say anything about it. But as you know, it's a, it's a threshold signature scheme. It's based on oblivious transfer to, to securely multiply 
shared values. Uh, and what's important here uh, is that if, if this multiplication protocol fails, uh, then a malicious party can actually learn secret bits uh, from, from other parties and eventually recover full private key shares. Um, so for this reason, the paper instructs users to stop cooperating with parties that cause failures in this way. Uh, so that's all good, but this, it turns out that this is actually difficult to handle for implementers in a number of different ways uh, that I want to discuss. Um, so what we've seen is that it sort of introduces different ways for, for the attacker to sow distrust among honest parties. And obviously if too many honest parties distrust each other, there are not enough honest parties left to perform a signature operation anymore. Uh, so the first issue that we've seen multiple times is that um, typically these schemes are implemented as a, as a library that you call into to perform threshold signing and then there's sort of a high level implementation that takes care of persistence and networking and whatever, right? So when this issue occurs, uh, this library should, should flag that, hang on, a serious issue occurred and you, you shouldn't talk to this user ever again, basically. Uh, so what we found is that uh, there are multiple instances of libraries that flag this, but they don't flag who the offending user was. So this leaves the, uh, the user of the library in a very precarious situation. So, so basically she has two different choices and neither of them are great. So the first choice is to uh, not participate in signing with anyone because she doesn't know who who acted maliciously. Uh, so that's not good. Uh, the second choice is to just sort of hang tight and hope that this never happens again and just ignore the error. And that's not great either. So another issue that we found in, in one implementation was uh, problems with the peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication channel. So most of these protocols um, assume uh, an encrypted and authenticated channel. But in this case, we found uh, issues with the authentication that actually allowed um, an attacker to tamper with messages. And if you tamper with the messages related to this multiplication protocol, uh, this protocol would fail and the honest parties would end up distrusting each other. Um, another issue that we found uh, in one instance was with the oblivious transfer session instantiation. So, all of these sort of sub protocols take typically take a session ID to um, to to ensure that you get a unique instance of the protocol and and maybe to to use for domain separation. Um, and these session IDs are are very often generated in in sort of a collaborative manner. So it turned out in this case that the attacker could cause different honest users to get different session IDs for this protocol. And then that would be discovered during the multiplication protocol where uh, suddenly the results didn't match anymore. And the two users would end up distrusting each other again. So this, this feature of DKLS23 actually sort of introduces a, uh, an issue that, that sort of exacerbates other vulnerabilities uh, that we've found. So it's not a vulnerability in the protocol per se, but it makes the protocol more difficult to implement, I'd say. Okay, so what's been the point of this talk? Um, so these kind of key destruction attacks can lead to loss of funds, obviously, because you may end up losing the key. Uh, and the attackers can even hold the key ransom in some cases. Um, so obviously everyone should have a key backup and recovery process in place. Um, you should also validate what other parties sent to you before processing it. So something that I sometimes hear from, from developers and cryptographers is that I've implemented all the checks in the paper, so I'm secure, right? Because that's all that's needed for the security proof. And that kind of makes sense, but it sort of glosses over the fact that moving from the, the paper, I mean, for, for a start, you're assuming that the paper is correct and the author didn't miss anything, uh, which is not always true. But moving from the paper to the implementation also introduces new attack vectors that, that has to be sort of considered. So I think this 
sort of increasing the length of, of the this uh, this commitment or the polynomial in, in Feldman VSS is one example of that, where sort of the author kind of assumes that, well, this is the polynomial, I've written it down here, so you know the length, and it doesn't even say that you need to check it. And that makes sense in a mathematical paper, but that actually leads to vulnerability in the implementation. So, so make sure to validate everything that you know about the message. I think it's good advice, generally. Uh, and then finally, make sure that your peer-to-peer -peer protocols and broadcast protocols are implemented correctly and provide the security guarantees that you think that they do. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, we have some time for questions. So, any questions? Okay, I guess the session was very clear. Thanks. Okay, uh, please give a big round of applause for Frederick Targan, guys. Please.